you have a Bible, you can grab it. Uh, we're going to be in Matthew 27. Last week, Paul gave an excellent sermon <clears throat> on trusting God. And if you haven't, if you weren't here, I, I, I'd encourage you to listen to it. Uh, you can go on the website or our YouTube channel and, uh, and watch it. Paul, you said something last week. You said, sometimes God calms the storm and sometimes he calms us in the midst of the storm. And man, I've been sitting in that this week. I, it, just powerful. So thank you for last week for the sermon and, and calling us to trust God. Next week, church, we're beginning a new series and we're going to be focusing on who we are as a church, why we do the things we do, and, and what it is we're doing, and how we're all going to be involved and engaged in that, so where we're going as a church. And so it's going to be a great, a great series that we're kicking off next week. This morning is the last Sunday. Am I loud? <laughs> Maybe turn me down a little, Alex. Uh, th this week, we're finishing uh, What Jesus Didn't Say, and we, it's been our summer series. This is the last one, and, and we're doing What Jesus Didn't Say is He Didn't Say Anything. And so, uh, Tim, we're, I'm going to do this sermon. You're still up here? Well, yeah, when we uh, were reviewing what you were going to be talking about, the behavior speaking slow, being slow to speak, and... Maybe saying nothing at all. Yeah. Um, we were worried that you might not be able to do that. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm just going to be here to gently remind you if you start to. Um, really? Yeah, I'll just, it'll be gentle. Oh, just a, I'm just going to monitor. That's weird because I really believe God has given me this, this gift of speech, and I, and I talk. If I ever get in trouble, it's like all I need to do is just talk more. I can talk my way out of things. And Matt, see you're doing it again. Yeah. I'm just going to do this gently to remind you, okay? Well, that's helpful, maybe. It's a nice little song. It's a, and God is up in heaven, okay. and you are here on earth. So just let your words be few. <laughs> I found when I get in an argument with Mel uh, and, and it's not going well, probably the best thing for me to do is just talk more, like explain. If I can point out to her like places where she's wrong or off. I've got us up in heaven and Damn. you are here on earth. So remember. With my teenage kids, so just I love let, to... let your words be few. Yeah. <laughs> Actually, Tim, if we're going to play this game, I, I got a little song for you. Oh, you do? You ready? Yeah. Alex, hit it. Okay, you guys know this one? Oh, don't you dare look back. Just keep your eyes on me. I said you're holding back. She said, shut up. Just wow. stop dancing me, Tim. Come on. Yeah, all right. All right. Well, no, that's enough. <laughs> Get off stage. All right. <laughs> Paul's going to say any, something. Anybody have the scripture come to mind that says, I will dance even more undignified than this? <laughs> Just. <laughs> They sang dancing earlier. It was. We live in a world of words. Blogs, news, podcasts, tweets, articles, hashtags, TED Talks, and sermons. Oh, sermons. Paul's handing out an outline, and you can fill it out. You can follow along if needed. Uh, is there a time where words reach their end? Is there a time to be silent? When is it time to be quiet, 
to stop speaking. In your prayers, in your marriage, in your parenting, in your work, in your family, in your situation. Okay, you're getting this handout? The first one up there. Today, my pastor told me to shut up. If that's too, if that's too offensive for you, deal with it. Okay? Today, my pastor told me to shut up. Jesus, we just took communion together. Uh, on the night that he instituted that, it was, you know, about less than 24 hours before he was killed. And he was sitting with his friends and those closest to him, and they have this meal, and Jesus gives the communion, institutes communion. From there, he gets up and he goes out, and he goes to the Mount of Olives, and he gets down and he prays. And he prays. We've talked about this actually some of the summer. He prays and he prays, God, if it's possible, take this cup from me. Like, God, I don't want to do what's in front of me. I don't want to have to deal with the things that are facing me. But ultimately, but God, not my will, but yours be done. Then the mob comes. And they, and they come to Jesus and they capture him. They take him, that's the religious leaders, bring him into the synagogue, and they start, they start screaming at him. They start accusing him, and they bring false witnesses in front of him. Any words that Jesus speaks, they twist and use against him. They say, let's kill him. Let's kill him. But then they don't have the power to kill him. They don't have the authority to kill him, so they've got to go to the Romans. The Romans have the authority to actually kill him. So they take him to the Roman authority and the governor, Pilate. And they say, this man needs to be killed. He, he is blaspheming. He's breaking all of our laws. And so Jesus comes before Pilate. And the crowd's jeering at him and yelling at him. And Pilate pulls Jesus kind of into a private place. And he says, he says do you understand what's happening? And Jesus talks back very little. And he, Pilate says, are you the king of the Jews? And Jesus says, so what, so what you're saying? He says, no, no. Verse 13 and 14 in Matthew 27. Then Pilate asked him, Don't you hear the testimony they are bringing against you? Don't you hear what everyone's saying about you? But Jesus made no reply, not even to a single charge, to the great amazement of the governor. Jesus didn't say anything to the great amazement of Pilate. And this week, I've spent some time saying, God, why was that so amazing? Like, like, what is that? Why was Pilate amazed that Jesus said nothing? Probably because Pilate was a man with the authority. And, and when, when you stand in front of someone that has the, the power to kill you or to save you, Pilate's maybe been in this situation before. He knows people plead for their life. Right? Let me tell you my story. Let, let, let me cast blame on someone else. Let me explain what's going on. And, and they grasp for their own survival. And Jesus stands there and he says, nothing. Why was he silent? See, Jesus knew what was going to happen. But hear this, deeper than Jesus knowing what was going to happen, he trusted God. He said, God, the situation is going to play out for me. I, I've already done business with you. I've already said, God, not my will be done, but yours. And Jesus trusted God to such a level. He trusted his father to such a level that he was able to be silent and to say nothing. Now, Tim's right. Or staff's right. You guys that know me are right. How ironic that I'm teaching on keeping your mouth shut. It is not my greatest quality. Uh, I am so grateful Peter in the Bible, for those of us who've read the Bible or are a bit more familiar with it, Peter's like one of my favorite, maybe my favorite, because he's really good at, at talking and putting his foot in his mouth. And there's this one instance where Jesus is, is talking with his disciples. He says, who do, who do people say they am? Who, who do people say I am? They say, oh, they say this, this, this. And he says, well, what about you? Who do you say I am? 
And Peter says, you are the Christ, the Son of the living God. You are Messiah. And, and Jesus says, yes, Peter, blessed are you. You got it. You nailed it. You, and you didn't figure this out yourself. Like, God gave this to you. You, you were so right. And, and it's the truth. And on this rock, I'm going to build my church. And Peter's sitting there, and he's like, kaboom. Nailed it. Got the right answer in front of the class. Like, yes, I spoke, and it was spot on. Then Jesus says, yeah, and a time is coming where, where, where I'm going to get taken away, and I'm going to go through a lot of suffering, and it's going to be hard, and I'm going to be killed. Well, Peter, man, he's nailing it, right? So he goes, no, Jesus, never. We won't let that happen. Three verses, one, two, three verses after Jesus says, Peter, great answer. You nailed it. On this rock, I'm going to build my church. Great job. Three verses later, you know what Jesus says to him? Get behind me, Satan. And Peter's like, <laughs> what happened to the attaboy? Like, man. My voice, my words got me this great act like, yes, great job. And then three verses later, did he just call me Satan? Like, I was, I call it the Peter syndrome. I've got the Peter syndrome. A lot of you have the Peter syndrome, right? And, and, and that we have these experiences where, where, man, we nail it and our voice and what comes out and what we say and then we miss it. This morning, we're going to look at what the Bible has to say about shutting up in hopes that God will give us some insights, some challenges into refining us and directing us. So we're going to look into two main arenas this morning, two, two main arenas of shutting up. The, the first is shutting up in our interactions with other people. Lord, give us wisdom of when to speak and when to be silent. Yeah, you can fill that in if you want. Proverbs 13, 3. Whoever, hear this, Proverbs. We're going to open up some scriptures and look at what God has to say about being quiet when it comes time to our interactions with other people. Proverbs 13, 3. Whoever guards his mouth preserves his life. He who opens wide his lips comes to ruin. Guard your mouth. Write that in there. Guard your mouth. Can't even add on. Guard your mouth. Preserve your life. There is a power in our tongue. It is no accident that God spoke the world into creation. That, that, that Scripture says that, that, that man's first job was to name the animals, to give voice and to name, to call something. When Eve, well, I won't go there. I got all kinds of stuff. There's power in the tongue. We must learn to guard and put a guard over our mouth. I've been, uh, I, I've been, someone got me into duck hunting. And I actually have like really enjoyed it over the past five years. And maybe some of you are like, you do a what to a little what? But um, I've, I've been taking my son, and, and last year we took a, uh, a number of dads, took a number of younger, uh, of, our, of our boys, and they have this youth duck hunt. And so we took them out, and for most of them it was their first time hunting, and so they had shotguns. And so you, the very first thing when you're going to teach a, a, a young kid about shotguns and, and shotgun safety is that there is a safety, and that there's this button on a gun, and that when that safety is on, the trigger can't be pulled. You leave your safety on all the time, except for that very small time when the birds come in, you click your safety off, and you shoot your bird. Safety on a gun. So you teach them over and over. There's a safety. You keep your safety on. You keep your safety on. We need a safety on our mouth. God, give me a guard, a safety. Where is the safety for my tongue? Right? If you are constantly critical of your spouse, like, like, I want you to be thinking about this. 
Where is God pointing out some places in your life where you do this too much? If you are constantly critical of your spouse, do you recognize it? If you constantly joke in a matter which hurts other people or tears other people down, do you recognize it? If you have a foul mouth, can you recognize that? God, I need to put a guard over my mouth. When I first became a believer and when I first became a Christian, I used to say Jesus Christ in a non-God-honoring way. Or I would talk about God damning something, not in like, a, it like his cuss words. And this was kind of the way I spoke. And I was like, you know, I think God's done something new in my life, and I think he does not want me to do that anymore. And so it, wasn't, it was like I had to put a guard, so I, I just did a simple thing. And every time when I would say this word in a non-God-honoring way, I, I would, in my head, replace it like five times. And so I started saying, gosh darn it. You know, good job, man. I, I had to put this little guard on my mouth, say, gosh darn it. As God continued to work in my life and take me much deeper, you know what I said? I mean, I went from... God, mm -mm, to gosh darn it, to nothing. I, I don't even need to say that expletive anymore. I don't need to replace it. God, help me put a guard on it and then just help it go away. While a guard is good, many of us have a deeper work to do when it comes to our speech. Luke chapter 6, verses 45, Jesus is speaking. He says, a good man brings good things out of the good stored up in his heart. An evil man brings evil things out of the evil stored up in his heart. Hear this. For the mouth speaks what the heart is full of. Man, I love the Bible. The mouth speaks what the heart is full of. Some of us are full of of ourselves. You know how I know that? Because it's all you ever talk about. Some of us are full of insecurity. You want to know how I know? Because of how we talk about others. Some of us are full of a desire for power or control because of how we use our words to manipulate others and always try to get our way. Some of us are full of hurt. You can tell because of the anger that spews out of your mouth. See, Jesus stood in front of Pilate and he didn't say anything because his heart was full of trust in his heavenly Father. Your level of faith can be shown by your ability to be silent. Let me say that again. Your level of faith or maturity of faith can be shown by your ability to be silent. The most holy people I know, like the most mature, those I know who have the most authentic relationship with God are able to be in very tense and trying situations and often they say very little. They draw from a deeper well. It is because their trust, their faith in God goes so deep that it has transformed their heart. Which is what we really want. Which is what authentic relationship with God is really about. God, you transform us more into your image. In ways we can honor you and glorify you. There are some areas where we need just a guard on our mouth. There are other areas where we need a heart transplant. The key to both is learning, in both learning to guard our mouth and fill our heart with something new comes in the next arena I'm going to talk about. Okay, so in our interactions with other people, the next one, shut up in your interactions with God. One of the most powerful Old Testament uh, stories of, of the history of Old Testament is God leading his people 
out of slavery into uh, the promised land, the new land. But even deeper than that, like that's physically what's happening, even deeper than that, he's leading his people out of a place where their identity, what they identify with is slaves. We are slaves. We do what the culture around us tells us to do. We're slaves. We are enslaved to the, to the culture that we're in. And God says, no, I want to pull you out of a, cult, of, a, of a culture where you are enslaved to what it says. And I'm going to set you apart with a new identity. And it's your identity is going to be found in me and who I say you are. And you're going to be children of God, not slaves to the culture in which you live. And, and so God taking the Hebrew people out of Egypt and into the promised land. And this story in the Old Testament is one of the most profound. And then, of course, we could see where it connects in our time, in our day, as Jesus continues and God continues to pull us out of places of slavery and being enslaved to a world gone wild around us. It says, no, I want your primary identity not to be enslaved to the cultures and the impulses of the world around you, but your identity to be found in me. And, and so Moses is the main leader, and he leads the people out of Egypt but then there's this big sea and they come out and, and they say, okay, how are we going to cross this sea? And they turn around and all of a sudden Pharaoh ha is coming after them and there, there's this army coming towards them. And, and they're in this spot where they say, okay, we can't cross this way. I don't know what we're going to do to move forward. And, and here comes this army to kill us. We are not able to defend ourselves. And, and so, so they're in this place and they, they, ah. so they look, Moses, why'd you even bring us out here? Would have been better to just die as slaves where we can at least have graves and now we're going to come out here and get slaughtered in the desert. And, and Moses says to him, no. No, you need to trust God more. And, and hear this verse. In Exodus 14, 14, Moses says to him, the Lord will fight for you and you have only to be silent. God is calling us, God is forming us in a deep disciple-oriented faith. And friends, some of you, this might seem far off. Some of you might say yes. But get this, know this. God is forming us to be a people who trust him to a level that we were able to shut up. To stop all our striving. To stop all our flailing to recognize that God is in control, to trust him in that, and then to watch what he does. L listen to how Jesus teaches us about prayer. I mean, prayer is the place where we go to talk to God, right? To talk to God, to just talk at God a bunch. Listen to what Jesus says about prayer. And when you pray, oh, <laughs> I'm just going to be silent right now. <laughs> Do not keep on babbling like the pagans, the ones who don't really know God. Boy, they, they talk a lot. For they think they're going to be heard because of their many words. Do not be like them. For your father, he knows what you need even before you ask him. This then is how you should pray. Church, close your eyes. Our father in heaven. God, hallowed be your name. You are holy. You are creator. Your kingdom come and your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. God, I'm coming not with my list. I'm coming to say your ways be done. Give us today our daily bread. Lord, 
Be our sustenance today. You are enough. Forgive us. Oh Lord, forgive us our debts. Forgive us all the ways we miss it. We recognize we've got a long way to go. God, let us also, and forgive us also as we have forgiven others. Let us be a people who receive forgiveness and who give forgiveness. Lord, lead us not into temptation. Oh, there are so many temptations. The culture that wants to enslave us. God, but deliver us from the evil one. The one who wants to steal and kill and destroy. Be our deliverer. For yours is the power and the glory forever and ever, God. sit in the presence of God, words diminish. When we are silent, when we stop laying out our lists, we can hear his whisper, his voice. And our hearts, our mouths, and our lives are changed. Ecclesiastes 5, chapter 2, says it this way. Do not be rash with your mouth, nor let your heart be hasty to utter a word before God. For God is in heaven, and you are on earth. He is creator. Therefore, let your words be few. It's okay to say nothing. To be silent. Sometimes I just picture myself sitting before him. Kneeling before him. Lord, we trust you, build our trust in you enough that we are able to be silent before you.